Good evening and welcome to Boy Choir Banter. My name is Jason Alexander Holmes uh, and I'm the artistic director of the Cincinnati Boy Choir. Thank you for joining us. This is the fourth in our series um, of conversations. Um, our, our topic this week is uh, what is musicology? And I have a couple guests here to chat about this, real live musicologists. Um, <laughs> we have Dr. Tammy Kernodal and Dr. Stephen Meyer. Thank you so much, both of you, for, for being with us tonight. Um, we apologize, we had some technical issues there. Um, and now, now we should be all set and ready to, to jump into the conversation. So we've already had three boy choir banter conversations. Um, last last time we were talking about studying music in college, and we had some professors and a student, uh, a music student, to just chat about that experience. Uh, then before that, we talked about the composer's perspective. Uh, and then before that, we talked about the life of a performer. So you can definitely check those out on the Cincinnati Boy Choir YouTube page. So what are we all about for this Boy Choir banter thing? Well, we really want to spend some time thinking about some topics that we have time to just skim the surface of during rehearsal. Um, but now we have some time to really dig deep in uh, and, and, and see what we can learn about these topics. So this conversation about musicology is really for anyone who's interested in how music connects with kind of history and culture and politics. And the musicologists will um, add to that kind of definition um, in a minute. This is meant to be an interactive conversation. So if you're watching on YouTube live, um, give us your questions um, about the topics that we bring up. So with that said, oh, I should thank Katie McDonald, who is the one fielding those questions and, uh, and sending them to me here. So uh, thank you, Katie, for, for doing that work. And thanks for being our um, kind of resident IT person today. Um, so Steve and Tammy, let's do this. Let's talk about the basic thing. What in the world is musicology? Tammy, I'm going to send that to you first. And then Steve, you can jump in or uh, add on as you feel like you need to. So musicology is the study of the historical aspects of music. Um, and in recent years, that that has broadened in terms of its scope. So, you know, it it ranges from what we call historical musicology, which looks at the history of, of music from ancient times up to contemporary times. But that is kind of primarily focused on concert music or classical music. And then there's ethnomusicology, which deals with the cultural study of music um, in a more direct way um, of people actually doing ethnographic study. And then there's a third uh, kind of field in musicology that that some refer to by various terms, but it really deals with the scientific um, in some kind of in some ways the the psychological and the um, neurological aspects of of the study of music. And I'll, I'll let Stephen take it. <laughs> oh yeah, well just to add on to this, I just. Um, musicology is changing a lot right now. So, uh, you know, 50, 60 years ago, musicology was very closely tied to, oh, typical white European composers whose names you know probably pretty well, Mozart and Beethoven and Brahms and Wagner. And then um, in the last generation or two, musicology has really broaden the scope of the kinds of music that it looks at. Um, Tammy has actually been a really key person in that development, opening up um, the study of different kinds of music in different, different repertoires, different cultures, different peoples, bringing other kinds of music to the attention of the, of the broader world. And, um, and that, that process, I'd say it's accelerating now. Uh, especially as we move into a time of a lot of social change. And um, so it's actually a really exciting time to be thinking about this intersection of music and culture because it's changing so quickly all around us. Yes. Awesome. Well, this next question sounds silly after that, like really awesome definition of musicology. But the next question is, how did you come to choose musicology? I mean, after your answers just now, it's kind of like, how would you not choose musicology? <laughs> right? But uh, so, Stephen, why don't you tell us kind of your path to uh, being a musicologist? 
Well, you know, actually, I started out right where a lot of your singers in boy choir are. I didn't have a, something like a boy choir, but I was a singer and I was a performer and I was deep into that. And I really, really enjoyed that. But I always was interested in the kind of context and the stories that music was telling. And I was also interested in history. Yeah. So um, I, I kind of got into musicology through performance. And I think a lot of, uh, a lot of our colleagues kind of seem to follow that sort of pathway. And then, um, you know, then I started teaching uh, and I realized how much I love that, you know, musicologists, almost all of us are teachers as well. So, um, so that became a really, uh, a really fun thing to do. And um, I just realized that for me, it was a really good fit because it combined this love of the study of culture and the life of the mind. So I have, I've always had that. And then I've always loved music and loved singing. And this is a perfect way to bring those two loves together for me. Great. And where do you teach now? I teach at CCM at the University of Cincinnati. Great. So, cool. Yeah. Uh, Tammy, tell us about your path to becoming a musicologist. Well, mine was similar in that it started with performance. Um, I started taking piano lessons at a very young age. My grandmother played piano and, and many of my cousins um, played piano. And so the decision was made for me. I, that was not an organic <laughs> um, relationship. My parents decided as the oldest child that I would take piano lessons. And so between piano lessons and, and really singing in my local church choir really, you know, fed my love for music. Um, and then I had the experience of growing up um, in the South and in my hometown, there was an Ebony Opera Guild and you know and so i was exposed to opera very early and and wow. exposed to black concert artists um camilla williams the very famous uh opera singer actually was from my hometown and, and so one we of my just have to say this we just put it right out so you were from where again danville virginia and i grew up the county a county west of that in ridgeway virginia so I'm, these things are I'm, I'm 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 hearing things i didn't know about the ebony opera yeah so that's amazing and so they used to sponsor concerts so you know i i can remember seeing so many concert artists come through instrumentalists and vocalists right mm -hmm. um and they had these concerts in the area churches but also you know they would they would bring these individuals into the school system. So yeah. they would actually talk to us. And so um, so I went to undergrad thinking that I was going to be a concert pianist. And I always tell people that I learned out, I learned very quickly in my first semester, I was not. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I shifted my major to music education. I was passionate about music and I decided I was going to teach. and. You know, I did choral music education with a concentration in piano. Yeah. And then I discovered Eileen Southern's book, The Music of Black Americans in the library. And she just pulled me in. I always, always had a love for history. I'm a history geek. I mean, like, I only have Netflix for documentaries. I'm just gonna <laughs> be honest with you. <laughs> uh, you know, and so, and that just, it was just a it was just a combination of things you know i was first generation college student um i went to a historical black college um actually the college that camilla williams graduated from was wow. virginia state university you know and i was in this this environment where i met like undine smith moore the famous you know core conductor you know I, I, and so i was surrounded by all of these into individuals that were doing stuff on a high level and discovering that book and meshing that with my love for history. And I just ended up, you know, on this journey that um, ultimately took me to graduate school. And it's ironic that it wasn't a music professor who said, you should think about graduate school. It was a chemistry professor wow. who told me, I see something in you, right? Um, and I can see you doing something different. And he took me on a trip to visit Ohio State. And I ended up at Ohio State, the Ohio State University. And then uh, upon finishing my studies at Ohio State, I ended up getting a position at Miami University. 
and was only supposed to have been there one year. And this fall, I start my 23rd year there. So wow. it's been it's been a journey it, and it's not been a planned journey. But, you know, it was it's been a journey for sure. It's, it's one of the things that came up a lot in our last boy choir banter about studying music in college was this idea of really following your passion. And in both of your stories, I hear that idea that like, you know, I loved this and I loved this and it kind of guided your career path. So that's a um, especially the children who might be watching, that's a big thing. You know, I, I think sometimes it can seem like adults have things figured out. <laughs> if you had seen me trying to do this YouTube thing a minute ago, you would know that adults do not always have things figured out. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of it has to do with really having opportunities to explore passion um, and just kind of running with it. So, yeah. But I think also community support. I don't know, if Stephen, you could speak on this, but I had... My parents, even though my parents didn't go to college, you know, they were like, my brothers and I were going, but mm. my parents didn't make stipulations on us in terms of what we could study and what we couldn't study or major in in college. Mm. My parents just said, don't waste our money. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, do not waste our money. There was an expectation of excellence, but you know, it wasn't this caveat, like if we pay for you to go to college, you have to major in business, you right. know? Mm -hmm. And so that made a real difference for me. I don't know if you had a similar experience. Yeah, you know, Tammy, that really resonates with me. Uh, when I think about the world that we live in now, I think so often people see a university simply as a path to a better job. And, you know, in my generation, or maybe it was just my particular community, and maybe it was my family, because uh, I come from a family of teachers, it was really, it was just like, no, you're at university to learn and to explore and to grow as a person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whatever you end up majoring in, that's that's cool. But as you said, like, don't, don't waste our money, but, you know, do something with your life. Mm -hmm. Do something with your life. I, I'm not going to tell you what that is, but do something with it. Mm -hmm. Rather than uh, this idea of like, I'm going to go and I'm going to, get a bunch of stuff which is my knowledge and then i'm going to go make money with it you know i i was really fortunate in that that really wasn't a part of my sort of that wasn't in the air you know and i feel like it is for so many people now mm -hmm. Too mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. i agree yeah um so kind of going down this journey of musicology um, I know you both have specific interests in musicology. Um, so, uh, Tammy, can you talk a little bit about your interests and how you kind of chose it? Well, my my work is primarily on African-American music, and I do both popular and classical music under that rubric. Um, but my work also tends to, to focus on uh, women performers. Um, one of the main things that I see in the purpose of my music, of my work, is to widen the conversations that happen uh, in classrooms and what you hear in concert halls. That's the that's been my purpose from day one, uh, even arriving in graduate school, because I sat in college classrooms, even as in a at a black historical black college and didn't hear a lot of conversation about black music and black composers. And I studied with people who were celebrated that, I mean, when I got to graduate school, I'm discovering these people in <laughs> journal articles. I'm like, wait a minute, I took theory from this person. No, I took, and, and so that was disappointing to me because I said, I knew that I had come from a community that was rich in musical performance in, in, in a diverse array from string band music growing up there in the, you know, the heart of mm. the Blue Ridge Mountain, you know, the Valley of the Blue Ridge Mountains, yeah. all the way to concert music. But I was like, where am I in this, right? I don't hear myself being talked about. And so I will, I will tell you, it was very challenging. Because Stephen said, you know, when, when I entered graduate school in 1991, no one was doing what I was doing. They didn't even have an Americanist on the faculty, right? And so, you know, everybody was writing Renaissance and medieval re dissertations. And I was very interested in that stuff. I took all of that stuff, but I wanted to do more. 
And mm-hmm. so it meant that I had to go to American history. I had to go to the African and African American studies and women's studies and to get certain um, bases of knowledge, as mm-hmm. Stephen said, to be able to, to, to write. And so I write on jazz, I write on gospel, I write on classical music, I write on funk. I'm writing now on civil rights, black women in civil rights music and social change, you know, and so much of my my writing is inspired by what I want to see in a class. Like what I want to hear talked about or what I want to see. So, you know, I, I have a real deliberate agenda. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> it's real deliberate. Well, and I can tell you, I'm very thankful, you know, as a as a black musician who has gone through kind of the conservatory route. I'm thankful that that work is being done, because even when I entered, you know, conservatory in 2003, people were just starting to to notice that American music, that black music had a place in, you know, in, in being kind of um, discussed and learned. Um, it was, I mean, like I said, people were just noticing, so it didn't necessarily trickle down to my classes all the time, but I'm, I'm very thankful that, that the work was started because um, it made, like you said, it kind of made me see myself in, in, in my education. Um, Steve, where, what about your, your specialties, your areas of interest? Well, you know this, um, it's actually in Aesop's fables. It's the story of the fox and the hedgehog. Hmm. And there's a, 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 a famous um, extrapolation from that that talks about the way that people think, right? So the uh, hedgehog takes one idea, one particular topic, and then delves deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And the fox goes from topic to topic and scurries all around the neighborhood and maybe is a little bit superficial. Well, (laughs) I'm a fox in that (laughs) regard. I've done a lot of different things, you know. I have, um, you know, I started out because I was a singer. I was really attracted to opera. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm actually really interested to hear about this Ebony Opera Company. But we can have that, uh, uh, another conversation about that. So um, I wrote a book on a German composer named Karl Maria von Weber and uh, wrote a bunch of uh, articles and things on kind of the classic, you know, European white composers. And then I, I became uh, more and more dissatisfied with that. And, you know, uh, Tammy should know uh, that her work has influenced me, you know, uh, just like reading her work and um, thinking about her and other scholars who really uh, work, as she was saying, on opening things up. Um, so for me, that took a kind of a different path. I went into studying film music, wrote another book on film music and uh, various other sorts of topics. So I've done a lot of different topics. But, you know, right now, I've really been thinking a lot about the history of our own field. Mm-hmm. And I've been writing about that in the kind of the evolution of musicology itself and and the humanities in general and um, and just really thinking about uh, about how to respond as I was saying before to this this moment of I think it's this real moment of social change and uh, for me it's been a real time of moral reckoning as I've thought a lot about our our just the kinds of things that Tammy has been talking about the way that that the music of so many peoples and especially uh, black musicians in America has been overlooked or I would say isolated so that when we want to talk about the topic of race, then we talk about Duke Ellington or Mary Lou Williams, but we don't talk about race when we're talking about Johannes Brahms. Johannes Brahms is universal. Race doesn't No, That's not true. You know, race is a topic that inflects all different kinds of music, not just music created by black folks, but it's it's a it's a it's a very complicated uh, theme that's interwoven in every aspect of American musical life. And I would say even at the very most, when we're trying to deny that it is there, that's when we really need to look carefully at what's going on. So that's what I'm trying to do. I, you know, teaching and then also um, doing some writing about that as well. 
And, and let me interject because he is playing himself cheap. <laughs> He's talking about, I write a little bit about film music. He has a wonderful book. It's somewhere back here. <laughs> it's, it's, it's on my shelf back here. <laughs> and, and, and he does it in such a very clear and strong way, you know. And that's the thing about musicology that, um, that we see really happening amongst a generation of scholars, right? When you look at scholarship from 50, 60, 70 years ago, it was clear that people were trying to talk in the circle of musicology. And I think now what we have are people writing in a way that brings in you know, communities and people outside of our field, right? And so, you know, he's selling himself really, really cheaply because his work has been important in terms of, you know, really shaping what we hear, how we hear sound and film and, and in particular films. So I, I want to, I want to push back on that. that selling <laughs> itself is like, I just do, no. but he's also doing very important work. I know we've had those conversations, like he said about the history, but about teaching right mm. so we've never stopped to say why do we teach this and not this and I, I and i really appreciate him you know engaging that kind of conversation and, and doing that kind of work because now it is so needed as he said now we're scrambling we're scrambling our universities are scrambling to keep up with a generation that is not letting this go if mm -hmm. we have watched the television, this has not been, oh, just the same old cycle. You know, we've seen Trave uh, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, Philando Castile. Look at how many times over the last decade we have seen death after death after death. And this generation now in this critical moment is keeping that momentum, right? And it's bringing in other people who've never stopped to say, wait a minute, something's not right, you mm -hmm. know? And so our universities now have to have critical conversations in the classroom about, you know, how do we bring larger understanding about what's what got us here, right? And, and how does music relate to that in many ways? It, because every time there's been a movement of social change, not just here in America, but around the world, music has been central to that social change. Mm -hmm. right. Documentary it, speaking to it, uh, adding momentum to those movements so that those composers that Stephen were talking about and that whole notion of race, you know, French composers wanted you to know they were French composers, Germanic composers, mm -hmm. Italian composers. Those are not racial identities, but those identities shape what their music was and really their framework for thinking about you know, mm -hmm. what they were projecting to people. Mm -hmm. And we, we discount that sometimes when we say Western European music, right? And mm -hmm. we homogenize whiteness and Europeanness in a way that can mm -hmm. sometimes be problematic. And I'm gonna be quiet because that's <laughs> just another conversation. <laughs> we can go there next time on Boy Choir Banter. No, right. we can't go there. <laughs> this mean <laughs> right, exactly no i'm really happy to hear uh folks say that because i think we do sometimes forget that it's all connected right there's a connection between you know police killings of, of, of unarmed black people and the fact that we don't talk about black composers mm -hmm. uh it seems like it's really on two different planes but there there are connections there so i'm, I'm very happy to hear um you know that the academy is kind of saying we, we better catch up with this so and that there are students demanding that we catch up with that um so talk a little bit more about kind of the links that you see between music and history and music and culture music and politics um just talk a little bit uh, a little bit more about that for for our audience um that you know we some like i said sometimes i think we see these things as separate. So can you guys kind of provide a little bit, uh, some concrete links between those types of areas? Uh, Steven, I'll go to you first. Oh yeah, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start this and then I know Tammy's gonna have way more to say about this one because she knows so much more than I do about it. But let me start it out anyway. Um, just think for just a moment about 
um, movements, the countercultural anti-war movements in the 1960s and 70s. Can you imagine a history of those movements that did not talk a lot about music? I mean, not only specific musical groups in the way that uh, a fan culture kind of connected to a new sense of identity for so many people, but just think about, I mean, just to throw this out, you know, a song like We Shall Overcome and the Civil Rights Movement, you know, just like, you know, that's just such an important piece of the puzzle and an important it has an important function, right? So people in uh, large groups could come together around musical events. You know, uh, again, just to focus on Black America, you know, Marian Anderson and the concert uh, uh, on the mall, you know, this is an iconic moment and music is absolutely at the center of it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are tons of these examples. I'm just kind of skimming the surface, but um, you know, this is maybe a detour. And um, again, I'd like to hear what Tammy has to say, but I, I want to throw this out too. You know, a friend of mine was saying, this is a weird time because of the pandemic and because of especially the way that the pandemic has put restrictions on singing. Mm. That, you know, like this, this function of people getting together and singing together has been a really important part of social change for centuries you know what does that mean in 2020 so anyway i'm going to pass things over to tammy because i know she's she's given all these kinds of things a lot of thought. i think that's an interesting that's an interesting thing because you know i've been thinking a lot about what this pandemic has done in terms of decentering and um you know just our very existence um and and one thing that strikes me is how we have been forced in a way to to refocus our energies on the family right mm -hmm. and i really think that the the correlation between music and family and community and identity right is is so much a part of the american story and fabric and we take it for granted in so many ways that that we we don't understand that in some ways music was the one thing that connected all of us who came to this country. Mm -hmm. Whether you came in shackles, whether you came in indentured servitude, whether you came, you know, trying to escape religious persecution or you were trying to forge a new beginning here, right? Everybody brought that with them. But at some point in time, you know, some of us disconnected from those various things, right? And we began to coalesce around a a publicly mediated idea of musical life and musical culture and this is what represents America right and and one of the things that I really urge my students in my class because you know I teach Afri largely African-American music but the population that I teach it to is largely white I get a lot of white males you know um, and it can be difficult for you to talk about certain topics but the the, the point is that that you know, I try to make it clear, we're talking about history. We have to understand context and unpack that. But I, I'm, I challenge all of my students to go and trace family history. I'm like, do you know who you really are? Cause I, you know, I, I tell them where I'm from and what I know and how these musics fit into my life. But I ask them, do you know who you really are? And what has been music? What has been the role of music in your life? What's your first musical experience? What's the first thing, not, not I went to the Spice Girls concert. What's your first musical experience in the home? You know, and, and then I asked them to trace that history because so much of our history as a country has been rooted in music. And that can be a threshold. And if we take it, it can be a doorway for us to have conversations, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we have a conversation about 1893, when the Chicago World's Fair happens and we get ragtime and how ragtime is a music that was only heard amongst blacks in a certain area, but it becomes this national pastime, right? At the same time, 
that Jim Crow is beginning to emerge, right? So you've got people fascinated with black music, but we don't like black people. So, you know, like, and we also are getting restrictions on Chinese people coming. So, you know, like these musics and these things that are happening can be gateways for us to talk about these larger historical narratives and how do we get these stereotypes and how do we come to understandings and how do we move from white people being Polish and Russian and Czechoslovakian and, and you know, uh, you know, uh, Dutch or whatever to just being white, right? Like, when does that happen? Mm -hmm. And why does that happen, right? And so those are the things that I think music provides for us in relation to history, right? Mm -hmm. um, because most of us experience music outside the historical context. And even more so in 2020, because we're all this. Mm -hmm. Everybody's curating everybody's listening to their own thing. So it's very rare that we are all listening on one accord, right? Mm -hmm. You know, our concert attendance is more about capturing the experience than having the experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I went to see Janet Jackson a couple of years ago when she came here and I had to stop myself because I was like taking pictures. I was like, <laughs> and then I realized, I was like, you're not experiencing Janet Jackson. You are subscribing to this culture about trying to document it so other people can have it right and so i just put my phone down for the rest and, and and the music you know like it was 500 degrees outside it took me three days to <laughs> to, to recover but i danced for an hour and mm -hmm. and relived janet jackson and i was like wow what if we started putting away these things that are about you know, ex exploring or documenting an experience and trying to give it to other people and really have the experience. Mm -hmm. What would that experience be musically? What conversation could I have mm -hmm. if you and I are sitting in the same space and we're hearing the same thing and we're like, hey, mm -hmm. what does this take you to? And what does that take you to? You know, mm -hmm. I, I think it could be an inroads. It, it may seem mm -hmm. very simple or mm -hmm. Pollyanna, but I think it could be inroads. Yes, can, I, can I jump in on that? Sorry, yes, Jim, yeah. for derailing this. But, oh, I love um, it. It's good. One, one of the things that, you know, I, it's such a simple thing that I tell my students, but it's really true. Think about the revolution of recorded sound, in the, especially in the early part of the 20th century. And before that, if you wanted music, you had to make it or you had to know somebody that you were making or you had to buy a ticket to a concert. It had to be live people making music and, uh, you know, pianos and pianos were in every home because that was the music machine. That was what people used to make music in the late 19th, early 20th century. So that the, the tech technology is so it's transformed our relationship, but it hasn't transformed this fundamental music need. You know, as far as we know, there has been no human society in all of history that does not have music, right? It's just, it's hardwired as a part of us. And, um, you know, I'll just say one more thing. A, a yeah, professor of mine said this, I love her phrase here. She said, music is sticky, and slippery. This is what she meant, that music is always slipping between cultures and groups of people. Yeah. I mean, think about white Americans and black Americans. We have been using and borrowing and transforming each other's music from the day that we interacted with each other. And that's just, you know, that's what humans do. Um, and yet music also picks up extremely strong cultural associations. You know, you think about things like n the national anthem, right? Mm -hmm. Or I remember teaching a film music class and uh, playing Birth of a Nation, this iconic racist film from 1915 that has Dixie in it all the time. And, you know, looking at my white American and black American students and seeing their response, which was really, I mean, the three of us, all, all three of us have extremely strong reactions to the tune Dixie, mm -hmm. right? And we just, mm -hmm. you know, that's just, it just is. Um, but then, you know, 
I have students from South Korea. What is it for them? Oh, I can hear it begins with a descending major arpeggio. Oh, okay. Right. If they don't, they don't have that same sort of that baggage, that cultural baggage, which for us is so thick and deep. And, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's like there's all this history mm -hmm. behind that. Mm -hmm. So just like thinking about that, those cultural, that cultural, um, you know, weight and depth that Tammy is talking about when you're talking about like music in your family and what these, you know, these songs can pick up such rich, deep meanings. Mm -hmm. And when we really reflect on those and talk to each other about those, then I think we, we really become more human. And that's, that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. As a, as a teacher, I, one of my favorite things to do is figure out people's family music <laughs> things. And some people really struggle with answering that question. You know, how does music appear in your family? Because again, like you said, so much of it, if it happens, it happens here mm -hmm. and not necessarily among family members. Uh, one time though, a student did not struggle and the student was in middle school at the time and they said, oh, my earliest musical memory as a baby was uh, Rihanna's Umbrella. Um, you know, you can be, and I was an adult at this time, and I was like, wait a minute, oh, hold on. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, wait a minute, I was an adult when it came out, and I'm still in a, this is very strange for me. <laughs> I don't, it was one of those, like, I'm grown now. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So strange. Um, yeah. But yeah. kind of, uh, Going along those lines, um, as performers and educators, um, you know, before we before we started the YouTube, we were talking about how, um, especially in the field of music education, we are realizing the importance of context more than ever, and it's a very, I, I for me, it's a very welcome realization, um, and I think performance organizations are realizing that also that it matters whose music we were performing and the, the trends of, of, of that matter. Mm -hmm. um, so what can musicology do for us performers and educators? Uh, what, what role should musicology play in the way that we kind of approach our work? Um, Tammy, I'll go to you first. Mm. Well, I think it, it, there's many different things that musicology can do for a performer. I mean, it can bring you deeper insights about whatever composition or piece or repertory that you're going to do so that you understand really what was the intention at that time mm -hmm. and sometimes even how that is evolved over time right you know so like for instance if you're doing a uh, concerto you know uh, the cadenzas used to be improvised and now, you know, many people just play what were the most famous ones that were transcribed in the 19th century. Well, most people wouldn't even know that, you know. Um, but I think they also can provide you uh, singers a pathway to understanding a particular composer in their life and what that piece meant at that time period in their lives, you know. Um, so I, th I think it can provide fertile information in trying to shape a performance or understand what might be uh, correct for a performance. Cool. I'll and, let Stephen take yeah, it. Yeah, go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with all those things. I know it, it might sound strange to use this language because we're academics and, you know, we write and teach and we have lots of facts at our disposals, but really, I think what musicologists can do for performers is really inspire them with stories. Mm. You know, mm. um, these songs that people sing, these operas, they're not notes on a page. You know, mm -hmm. I, I have a lot of composers who kind of just say, you know what, I just want to know about the music itself. Mm -hmm. And I, my response to them is there isn't any such thing as the music itself. Every piece of music that we listen to, every piece that we sing, every piece that we play has this rich history, uh, the composer and his or her intentions, but also this rich and complicated performance history. And it's referencing back and back and forth. You know, I this is on my mind, right? Because I'm trying to think about my music history, kind of the, the survey class. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really trying to include um, uh, black composers and women composers way, way more than it has been in the past. So 
I'll just bring up this one piece. I uh, that's it's a great piece, and I'm sure Tammy knows it way better than I do. Uh, Florence Price, who was the first African American woman to have a symphony performed by a major symphony orchestra, in I think it was 1930. So this piece that she wrote, Symphony in E Minor, um, you listen to it, and it has all of these references. It has references to Dvorak New World Symphony. It has references to jazz. Uh, and all of those references are a part of that, that symphony. It's a, it's a, as a piece of music, it's, it's very beautiful and fun to listen to, very accessible piece of music. Um, but it also has all of these connections and links to these other works and of course to her own identity as an african-american woman trying to be a composer in the early 20th century it's really extraordinary so bringing all of that to the table how can you sit in the orchestra and play it without having your performance transformed by that knowledge and by those links you want it to be transformed you want the music to be something more than a mechanical production of sound it's it's a vehicle for the spirit isn't it ultimately and so and so the history and the cultural context are are, are such a huge part of that mm -hmm. yeah. yeah for me it's helpful to think about um the fact that there were actual living human beings who had, you know, complications in their lives, who had, you know, great joy in their lives and great sadness and everything yeah. in between. Um, and I don't think anyone wants to hear anything that's just like mechanically produced notes, you know, like those, right. those types of performances. I'm like, okay, bye. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't need to be there for that. That's so, um, yes, yes. So, um, what is kind of either the the coolest or the most meaningful or the most invigorating project you've worked on um, as a musicologist? Um, and it really can be either some you know something very touching or something that was just insane, like I can't believe I'm working on this or whatever. Just standout <laughs> moments in in the world of musicology. Um, Stephen, go ahead. Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, um... I really like, I, for me, the latest book project that I did, um, I was um, an editor with a friend of mine. And uh, it was a book on, on music and medievalism. Mm -hmm. So references to medievalism. And these were, you know, sometimes in classical music, we had a section where it was on, you know, popular music, we had articles about Viking death metal, and we had articles about, uh, you know, Rafe Vaughn Williams, and we just like all these different people from all around the world writing from very different kinds of perspectives. Um, but for me, what was really, um, what was really fun has been really working as an editor. I know a lot of academics kind of like don't like that task, but um, I've done quite a bit of it, and I, I really like this process of, you know, working with somebody's text and then helping them to try to find the most eloquent way to express their ideas. And uh, I find that I learn so much and grow so much from that process. So, so yeah, that's that's kind of what jumps to my mind right away. Cool, cool. And Tammy. Um. I would have to say it's been some things that would have taken me kind of outside of what we typically think of as musicology. Cause mm. you know, most people, when they talk about musicology, they think of what we do on a daily basis, which is teach at a college or university. Right. Um, and, and we write books and do the scholarship that way. So I think uh, there's two things. Um, one has been the work that I've done with museums um, so I worked with the Kansas City Jazz Museum for two years mm -hmm. under an initiative, a women in jazz initiative, where we did programming that really tried to, um, to you know, highlight what had been uh, female achievements in jazz in terms of the evolution of jazz. And so that was a really interesting um, experience because, you know, you're, you're, you are, you um, are, you're dealing with the public. So you have to learn how to really take, you know, material that you would 
if if Stephen and I were having a private conversation, you know, we would use a lot of jargon. We would use a lot of, you know, of the terminology and the theory, right? But when you want people to be able to access the material, right? So it, that was a, a real learning experience. Um, and then in 2012, I got a call. <laughs> And it, I was, at first I thought I was being punked, if you all remember that show <laughs> from MTV. I got a call from the Smithsonian asking me, would I be a part of a team that was putting together um, music exhibits for the new museum of national, uh, the National Museum of African American History mm. and Culture. And so for four years, um, I worked as a scholarly consultant um, if you go, if you've been to the museum, it's eight floors and the top mm. floor deals with African-American entertainment. So half of it's music, the other half is television. So I was one of the scholars who, uh, who worked with the team to really put those exhibits together. And that was an amazing experience for me because as a young child, as you know, we weren't, we didn't live close, far from uh, Washington DC. And yeah. so in elementary school, you know, <laughs> what really really birthed my hunger for history was going to the Smithsonian yeah. and in particularly the National Museum of American History right like uh you know I I just loved seeing all the artifacts uh housed in that that particular museum so to then be able to uh to contribute to what people will see at at wow. least for a period in time was just an amazing feeling for me it was surreal uh, you know, yes. and to see the museum come up from nothing, from plans to, you know, an actual building. It was, wow. it was just amazing. That's really cool. It is. Wow. Um, so we're kind of coming towards the end. Um, and so I have one more question and I'll kind of roll in um, the a question uh, from, from our audience. Um, and that is, so if folks are considering a career in musicology, um, let's say it's a high school student, middle school student who is considering a career in musicology, uh, what do they do? And how do you, I mean, how do you recruit those students? Um, I don't know if you wait until they're undergraduates and then like kind of, <laughs> you know, put your musicology clause <laughs> or like, how does that, how does all of that work? Um, so yeah, what can students do to prepare for um, studying or being a musicologist and um, how do you recruit uh, those students for, for the field? Uh, Steven, go ahead. Yeah, you know, so music history there, it's not a very common undergraduate major. Right. So most of our graduate students do not have a degree, a, an undergraduate degree in music history. They have undergraduate degrees in things like, you know, regular history or sometimes English literature or um, American studies or African American studies or something like that. Mm. Um, so really what we look for in our applicant pool um you know we look at people's grades obviously but we also look at uh, people's writing mm -hmm. you know that's if you can't writing is one of those kind of basic skills for musicology and related fields you know you just have to be able to express yourself eloquently and uh, not only in the written word but also in the spoken word because teaching is fundamental to what we do. Um, so, I, so I look for those kinds of things. And, you know, you kind of began by talking about the importance of following your passion. Hmm. And that's also what we look for, you know, people who are passionate, not just passionate fans, because there are lots of people that I love this particular group. That's great, you know? That's a big part of music and big part of loving music. You know, I don't want to stomp on that ever. <laughs> right, but, right. Uh, you know, um, people that are interested in taking that, that kind of attraction to music and then using it as the point of reflection. So, wow, you know, I love this group, but how does that connect to what's going on in the world and what are they trying to say? And, you know, those kinds of questions. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I would say just follow your passions and keep going with music, keep going with making music and listening to music, but then really find, uh, find opportunities in college to get, get a really broad education that asks mm. you to think critically and do a lot of writing. 
Got it. Yeah. And Tammy? So we have a different scenario at Miami in that we actually have an undergraduate degree in music that you can concentrate in history and culture. Mm -hmm. um, and this year we are welcoming our first real class because what we've had previously, if we've had students who have migrated to that major, so they've mm -hmm. come in doing one thing. But like Stephen says, that is an undergraduate degree that's based in kind of a liberal arts approach to music. And so you're making music, but and you're taking music history courses in specific areas, but we also require that you take anthropology and you take religious studies and you take, you know, um, you know, just different courses, sociology, different things across the gamut, which fits into Miami's whole, uh, you know, spirit of liberal education, where every student has to take, you know, a certain um, array of classes under, you know, the foundation of liberal ed. And mm -hmm. our notion is that we are trying to prepare on an undergraduate late, uh, level for people to go to Stephen on the graduate level. And so it's not a degree so much in musicology, but it's a degree for anyone who's looking to do the kind of studies. If you want to do curation, museum curation, or if you wanted to do library, you know, because music library and shit, we haven't talked about that, right? Because some musicologists do, uh, they, they become librarians. So they do musicology and then they go and do a, a librarian's degree, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, and, and so we try to prepare. And what we've seen from the students that have applied directly to our program, what we've urged them to do is to think about writing. So if you're interested in musicology, as you are, you know, going through high school in particular, it's really about trying to find ways to, de to develop your writing skills, right? Um, because we ask for writing samples you know, we ask for you to, uh, to to have a perspective, not necessarily where you want to go, but, you know, you be able to articulate a perspective about music, right? Um, and, and so, and we ask for different types of writing mm. so that we can see, you know, the diversity of your skill set in relation to that. And so, you know, it we have been doing this kind of in a... Um, not in an official way for many years at Miami because we've had a lot of students who've come in and they've done a beat well, bachelor's of arts degree. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they may have done it in piano, but they wanted to go to an ethnomusicology program or musicology. And so what they did was advanced study with a professor. They did an independent study or a particular project. And so we have become kind of focused on how do we take students who now engage with people like us. Like, you know, your your audience is has now seen Stephen and heard from Stephen. You've now heard from me, you know, and so their interest may be peaked, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're like, I know someone who does this, right? Because I never saw anyone who did this until right. I got to grad school, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I knew Eileen Southern's name, but I didn't know Eileen Southern and I never <laughs> met her, right? You know, I just knew her book and what she had done. And so, you know, it's connecting, it's connecting with people. So I constantly, you know, talk to young people just like we are doing now. And I talk to them about what I do. And I talk to them about preparation and, you know, and as, as long as you have a base of knowledge and that's what the understanding, I hope that people take from this conversation. Mm -hmm. Stephen said something very powerful early in this thing which is about most people come to school and they think it's about, you know, I, I do this, this, this is a checklist and then I go off to a job, right? When it's really about the acquisition of knowledge. And so this generation has the potential of being much more prepared than we were because of all the access that you have. You have access to journalism, online journalism, you know, Slate, Rolling Stone, you, you have access to encyclopedias, you have access to all of these things, which can show you the potential of the different kinds of ways that maybe you can uh, prepare yourself mm -hmm. or think about a career in musicology, you know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Great. Um, well, this has been a wonderful conversation. It like went all over the place and somehow <laughs> to me, feel, it still felt as if we were like having a coherent conversation. So yay us for being able to accomplish that. Um, there are two quotes that I think are perhaps the most um, 
musicologist quotes ever. It was one from each of you. Um, uh, Steve, you mentioned Viking death metal. And who else <laughs> talks about that? <laughs> the musicologists. And the other thing is, uh, Tammy, you said Netflix is for documentaries. <laughs> and I was like, that, that sounds Stay like away a... from the Tyler Perry movie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, thank you both so much for this conversation i've learned a lot uh and i look forward to chatting with y'all later um because as i said i think as in the education and performance world uh i think i think we have a lot to offer each other between education and performance and and, and musicology so i'm um, looking forward to continuing our conversation but this is all for this youtube thing for now um so thank you so much for watching also thank you katie for uh filtering the questions and sending uh, them to us our next boy choir banter uh, is us introducing our 2020-2021 season uh, with the Boy Choir. So we're excited to bring that to you. It'll be a very different season. Um, thank you, COVID. But we're excited to, to share with you what we're working on and what we're, we're planning. So thank you so much. Thank you again, Tammy and Steve. And we will see you the next time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.